Hey, this is Ken Smith. This is part two of the video talking about taxes and savings, long-term savings for retirement and other long-term purposes. If you haven't seen part one, it's going to tell you, we talk about how we kind of got to the situation we're in and kind of the outlook for taxes going forward. Uh, if you haven't seen that video at the top of your screen right there, if, you're, if your screen allows that, there's a little eye you can click on that'll take you to that first video or in the description below, there's a link to that first video. Uh, feel free to go back and watch that before you watch this video. So we left the last video talking about kind of how we got to this point uh, and what's likely going to happen with taxation uh, going forward. Most likely it's going to go up, almost certainly has to go up at some point. Uh, and now let's talk a little bit about the decisions we should be looking at right now as to where we want to save our money going forward. So there's really kind of three big buckets as to where you can save their money. The first one is just simple taxable bucket, right? It's savings accounts at the bank or at the credit union. It's uh, uh, stocks and bonds and mutual funds inside a brokerage account at TD Ameritrade or Vanguard or wherever else. Uh, ETFs, uh, money markets, CDs at the bank. Uh, all of those things are taxable investments and we'll talk more about those in just a minute. And real estate also, by the way. Second bucket at a high level is tax deferred options. 401k plans, pension plans for those who, there are very few people who still have pension plans available to them, IRAs, which are individual retirement accounts, or 403b plans, which are similar to 401k plans generally for tax-exempt organizations. And in the last place is tax-free, uh, and there's only a couple of them. There's municipal bonds, uh, also known as muni bonds, there's Roth IRA, there's Roth 401k, and then we're, believe it or not, going to talk about life insurance because there's some tax advantages for a few people for life insurance as well. So let's take a little bit deeper dive in each one of those buckets. So let's first talk about that taxable bucket. So taxable buckets, some of the, ta some of the earnings are taxed annually. Those would be dividends and short-term gains or anything that you sold if you owned an ETF or a mutual fund or a stock and you sold it in a given year, you're going to pay taxes on those gains inside that account. You get a 1099. Uh, most of the time, those investments are going to be taxed or the bulk of those investments are going to be taxed when you sell them. So hopefully you do that after owning them for at least a year. So you get LTCG, long-term capital gains tax treatment. That runs between 20 and 23.8%, much better than the ordinary income taxes. The other stuff get taxed at up to 37%. Uh, typically, all of these investments are very liquid. If you need money to pay a bill next week, you can sell an instrument, the money's available really quick, and you can make those bill payments if you get in a bind. Uh, there is no limitations on the IRS as to how much money you can save in a taxable account. They don't care because they're going to get their taxes off of it. Uh, and then they are, by the way, on the liquidity, uh, real estate obviously is not very liquid. Um, so that's kind of the one on here that's not liquid. Uh, but then all of these are also subject to market volatility. If you own a mutual fund, if you own a stock, if you own an ETF, the market goes up, you go up. But if the market goes down, you go down. If the market's down, you know, March of 2020, 30%, then your value is down 30%. And there are available options to you that, um, that don't take that ride down. We'll talk more about those. Uh, by the way, there is a great deal of talk or significant talk on Capitol Hill about changing long-term capital gains tax rates to be taxed as ordinary income. They are considering those, or the, the, the talk generally is long-term cap gains tax treatment is for rich people, and we shouldn't be uh, setting up our tax policy to benefit only rich people. So if that changes, this conversation changes even more dramatically. Okay, the next bucket is tax deferred. So again, 401k plans, pension plans, individual retirement accounts, not Roth, different animal, we'll talk about that in a second, or 403b plans. Uh, when you put the money in, you're not taxed on it. The earnings grow tax deferred, but Uncle Sam will have his hand out when you get to retirement. You're gonna pay ordinary income taxes, which by the way, you're gonna see in a minute, has a very significant impact on where uh, tax deferred will fall in the uh, hierarchy of where you should be saving money. Um, they are subject to market volatility. Uh, they will impact your taxability for Social Security benefits. They're called provisional income, if you don't know what that is. Uh, if you have really no other income, most of your Social Security benefits will not be taxable. Uh, if you have provisional income, which any money coming out of a 401k plan or a 403b plan or an IRA is considered provisional income, 
that will drive up what percent of your Social Security benefit will be taxable and also what the tax rate is on that benefit. If you want to get to this money early, Uncle Sam's going to hit you with a 10% penalty if it's prior to 59 and a half. There are a few rules you can get around that uh, when you're older and you have to take them out in equal sums. And if you want to talk about that, I'm glad to talk about that with you one on one uh, in a side conversation. Uh, but you will also owe ordinary income taxes on anything you pull out prior to the age of 59 and a half. Now, Uncle Sam has a vested interest in collecting taxes now, so they greatly restrict how much money you can put into these plans. Into a 401k plan for 2020, you can put $19,500 if you're 49 years old or younger, or $26,000 if you're 50 years or older. Now, there's a bunch of caveats around that. Uh, most people who uh, I give this presentation to are considered highly compensated employees by the IRS based upon their income. If that's the case, their plan has to pass specific testing uh, uh, criteria in order for them to be able to put money into the plan. I'll put up another video talking about that, especially for those of you who are self-employed, about whether it makes even sense to have a 401k plan versus other options available to you. So I'll get that video posted up and when I do, I'll come back and add an I at the top here so you can go look at that video. But they're gonna limit, again, if you have a 401k plan option to you available at work and you have the ability to save that much money, you're almost certainly gonna be a highly compensated employee and unless your plan has specific provisions in them, you might not even be able to save that money inside of the plan. You also, the traditional IRA, uh, are again, greatly limited as to how much you can do into that. You can do $6,000 if you're 49 or under, or $7,000 if you're over 50. Again, these are 2020 numbers. Um, but if you have income, and again, if you are watching this video, you're probably, unless you're very young, you're probably above these thresholds. If your income is, I believe it's uh, less than $98,000 as a couple or $61,000 for an individual, you can actually deduct your IRA contribution. Uh, it, the, the deduction phases out up to $118,000 income. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff that goes in there as well. If, you're, if you have a plan at work, a retirement plan, you might not be eligible. Again, glad to talk to you about all those so I don't continue getting in the weeds about IRAs, but there are rules specifically around IRAs and who can do those. So again, the IRS limits how much you can get into those plans greatly and uh, with a lot of rules around those, glad to talk to you about that. And then you're going to owe ordinary income taxes when you pull money out of any one of those options, which leads us to the tax-free bucket, obviously where we would love to be. We would all love to be in the tax-free bucket. So the first place, most, first thing most people think about when they think about tax-free investment are municipal bonds. So municipal bonds simply is you loaning money to a municipality. If the city of Plano wants to build a bridge or a new city hall, they would issue a bond. Uh, you would invest in that bond. The city would then pay you 3% per year for the next 30 years. And if you were a Texas resident, uh, well, of course, we don't have state income taxes. Let's do it again. If you were in New Jersey uh, and you bought a bond from a city in New Jersey, uh, that income off that bond annually would be tax-free. So typically, municipal bonds have lower, excuse me, have, have slightly lower yields than taxable bonds, but they do that because they know that you get the tax break on them. So that's what makes them to some degree attractive. Just know a couple of things. If you are in a state with a state income tax, then if you buy a municipal bond in another state, they may not honor that tax-free benefit. It's a state-by-state -state, uh, deal. Just consult your CPA about that. Uh, also know that it's only the interest on the bond. If you were to sell that bond, the capital gain on the sell of that bond is not tax-free. It's only on the annual or monthly or quarterly, however you get paid interest on your municipal bond. Uh, also know if you're investing in municipal bonds, there are seven states with no income tax. That would be Alaska, Florida, Texas, Nevada, South Dakota, Washington, and Wyoming. If you buy a municipal bond from one of those states, their rates will be slightly higher because they know their state residents aren't motivated to buy their bonds based upon that lower tax rate, excuse me, based upon the state income tax free uh, aspect of them because there is no state income tax. Okay, Roth 401k is the next option in the tax-free bucket. 
Let's not confuse, there's a Roth 401k and a Roth IRA. We'll talk about both. A Roth 401k, you have to have a 401k offered by your employer and they have to have a Roth option available. It's just an amendment. If they don't have one, go to your HR department and say, guys, give us the dang Roth IRA option in here. They probably will. It won't cost them a darn thing to do it. Same limits, $19,500 if you're under 50. If you're 50 or over, $26,000 in 2020 that you can defer into a Roth 401k plan. You can put uh, the $19,500, you could split it. You could do $97,50 in the traditional, $97,50 in the Roth. You could put it all in the Roth. You can put it all in the traditional, but you can't do $19,500 in each. $19,500 is the total limit for the two. And by the time you're done watching this video, you're going to realize there's no reason to invest in a traditional 401k plan. The Roth just blows its socks off. Roth 401k, my favorite. If you have that available to you, put every penny you can put in there. It's just a great idea. They will still match if your company offers a match. The match will go into the traditional. That's just the way matches work. But you should max out your Roth IRA, a Roth 401k option if you possibly can. Because again, remember, uh, any income you take out, provisional income from a traditional 401k is going to impact your social security taxable benefits. So that is yet another reason that Roth outshines traditional, but I'm going to prove it to you in numbers here in just a second. Roth IRA, okay? A Roth IRA, uh, it's a, another excellent place to save tax-free, but again, if you're watching this video, you probably can't even do one. If you make less than $196,000, you can do the full $6,000 into it. If you're 50 or over, you can do $7,000, but it fades out. If you earn between 196 and 206, you can do a partial. It fades out completely at $206,000. Uh, generally, the access on both the Roth 401k and the Roth IRA are limited to five years and age 59 and a half, the longer of, for you to access those funds but it's different from traditional in that the money you put in there, you've already paid taxes on it. So you're never going to owe taxes or penalty on what you put into it. It's only on the growth that you would owe taxes or penalty if you access it prior to age 59 and a half and the five years, again, the longer of. Again, almost always subject to market volatility because a Roth 401k or a Roth IRA are going to be invested in stocks, uh, mutual funds or, e or ETFs which go up and down with the market. So you're going to take that ride along just like we all just did in March of this year. Okay, last option uh, that nobody generally wants to talk about online uh, is life insurance. And uh, you're going to hear it called, uh, there's two big ones online right now, a LIRP, L-I-R-P, Life Insurance Retirement Plan, or Be Your Own Bank or the Infinite Banking Concept. Look, Life insurance works for a few people. It does not work for everybody. This is simple math. If it works, who gives a crud what they call it? It's life insurance. If the math works, the math works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. If somebody's pitching you, and I'm gonna use, that's a mean term. If somebody's pitching you one of those other two, then they're probably not consulting with you and you're gonna, the, the results of the analysis are gonna be you need a life insurance retirement plan or you need an infinite bank uh, where you're your own banker. I'm sorry, by the way, and, and another thing they're gonna pitch you on there is whole life insurance. And I am a, a big fan of whole life insurance. I sell whole life insurance, I own whole life insurance. Do not buy one of those plans with a whole life insurance option. And here's the reason why. Whole life insurance has very specific uh, premium requirements in the early years of the policy. So all permanent policies are either built on a whole life chassis or on a universal life chassis. Again, a whole different conversation we can get into a different time or one-on-one. -on -one. A whole life chassis has very specific premium requirements. And we all think if we go into one of these plans, we're going to fund it to the, the 30 or the 50 or the $200,000 a year as we plan to. But things happen. Look what just happened in, the, in our world. COVID happened. You could have had a very, very successful restaurant making $5 million a year four months ago, and you're laying people off right now. You've got to have flexibility in funding. 
My doctor clients that do surgeries, that do elective surgeries right now, they're not able to earn near the income they did. If I had put them in one of these plans as a surgeon making $4 million a year and they said, I'm going to fund it a half a million dollars a year into whole life policy, and all of a sudden they can't fund it, you have very significant problems with the whole life policy. Again, I'm a believer in whole life. I'm an owner in whole life. You need to be using universal life policy where you can skip a premium, you can make it up, you can never make it up, you can make a partial premium. That's my soapbox on that, but if you're gonna do one of these options, whole life insurance is not flexible in these options. So we're gonna talk about life insurance. Sorry, I got on a soapbox there. We're gonna talk about life insurance. It'll make sense or it won't. It probably makes sense for 30 or 40% of all the people we talk to. For those, it really makes sense. For a lot of other ones, it doesn't. And it's, again, simple math. It'll be your decision once we work through this process. So let's look at four options. And we're going to suspend reality, by the way. So we're going to assume we can fund all of these four options with $36,000, which we already know we cannot fund any kind of an IRA, whether it's traditional or Roth, with $36,000 nor can we fund our 401k plan with $36,000. But the easiest way to show apples to apples to apples to apples from a numbers comparison was to assume we funded them all identically. So that's what we've done. We're also gonna give a significant advantage to three of the four options here. So we're gonna have three of the options at 7% return and one of the options at something way less than 6% return. So from the taxable bucket, we're gonna assume we're gonna have a savings account at the bank or credit union or brokerage account. It really doesn't matter because we're gonna assume it earns 7% gross in net. And I say it that way because we're not gonna assume that you earn 7% gross and pay a broker 1% or 1.5%, which would be typical. We're gonna just assume you made seven and you took seven home, okay? The second thing, we're, so that is, by the way, from the taxable bucket. Then we're going to look at something from the tax deferred bucket. We're going to look at a traditional IRA and it could be a 401k. It doesn't matter. They're basically taxed the same way. Again, we're going to assume a 7% gross and net return in the traditional IRA and or the traditional 401k. Those are synonymous for this, for this conversation. Then we're going to talk about the tax-free bucket, and we're going to look at a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k. The only difference really in the two, largely, or how much you can put in them. So again, 7% gross and net return from those two. The last thing we're going to look at, oh, I've already talked about that, so we're going to assume uh, we can do $36,000 in each of those. Uh, we just want to review the math, right? That's all we're looking for here. And then the last thing we're going to look at is, uh, from the tax-free bucket, a properly structured, um, how much money you can put into a, uh, a life insurance policy based upon the death benefit. So again, just like in the tax deferred bucket, they know that you are getting some tax advantages, some significant tax advantages in a life insurance policy. So they're gonna say you can't buy a million dollar death benefit with a million dollar premium. You have to have what's called a corridor. We're not gonna get into the weeds on that, but if it's properly structured, there are tremendous tax advantages for some people, not everybody, for some people inside of a life insurance policy. We're going to assume a number we are confident we can get from that life insurance policy, which is a 5.76% return. That's the historical return over a very long period of time on a look back. So we're giving the taxable, the traditional, and the Roth all a 7% return. And we're going to handicap the life insurance policy at a 5.76% return because I'm not going to show you a number that I can't attain. So let's take a dive into the numbers. Okay, again, from left to right, traditional taxable account, brokerage account, let's call it, traditional IRA, traditional 401k, traditional Roth, excuse me, a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k, and then the individual life insurance. We made it pretty simple. Green's good, red's bad. So what we see here right off the bat from an account value standpoint, what you get every month from your brokerage account, what's my account value? That's all you look at, right? I got $680,000 in my TD Ameritrade account. That's my account value. And what you see here is traditional IRA would be the best performing right off the bat because there's no taxes on them and there's very, very little, again, we're ignoring any brokerage fees, but there's very little drag because of load. So you can see there, those two are identical because again, we're looking at account value 
not net spendable value. The worst place to be invested is inside a life insurance policy. By the way, that number of worst place to be invested is going to vary. It's going to be shorter for some people. It's going to be longer for some people. And the reason is everybody's policies are different. So in a life insurance policy, you have premium tax. So again, the IRS has given you tax advantage. So they tax state and federal taxes called DAC tax or premium tax. They tax every penny going to a life insurance policy. They do the same thing in annuities. And I, by the way, in my last video, I didn't talk about it in this video. I am not a believer in annuities. I'm not even going to address them here. And the reason is there are very few people that annuities make sense of for savings. Now, in the income years, it might be a different story because some people really like having a guaranteed income. That's a SPIA, a single premium immediate annuity. I'm talking about a tax deferred annuity. The annuities that financial planners are out there touting like crazy with all these phantom buckets of potential return in there. The problem is every penny, every penny coming out of a premium deferred annuity, which is what you're being pitched, and it can be called a variable annuity or an index annuity, every penny coming out of it is taxed at ordinary income taxes. There's no reason you want to have your retirement income if you can avoid it taxed as an ordinary income tax at the ordinary income tax rate. So back to life insurance. Sorry, got a little off on a tangent there. You also got to pay for cost of insurance. Now, most of us are already paying for term insurance, but it's still a drag on the return. And the loads don't, for the early years, all those loads, the cost of all those loads simply don't offset the tax defers, the tax advantage aspect of a life insurance policy for most people. I will also tell you, the life insurance typically looks much better for people in decent health than in people in bad health because bigger loads on the life insurance policy for cost of insurance on those who are not healthy. So sometimes we do these on people who aren't healthy for other reasons, but if it's strictly a play to try to save for retirement, not going to be a great deal for you if you're uh, very unhealthy. You might want to do it on a spouse, might not. Again, everybody's different. Okay, now let's look at spendable value or liquidation value. So uh, account value, what you see on your statement at the end of the month, and liquidation value are not the same thing. I'm going to pick on annuities again. Uh, you got a million dollars on your statement on your annuity at the end of, when you turn 65, but you're in a 37% tax bracket. Really, you've got $630,000 of spendable value. This is a trap most of us have fallen into with our 401k plan. We look at it, we go, I got a million dollar balance in my 401k plan. Well, yeah, but you owe income taxes on all of that still. So traditional IRA, again, same as a 401k plan. And by the way, I'm assuming this, tr this uh, traditional IRA is a deductible IRA. And if it is a deductible IRA, then you would owe taxes on, on the entire balance. And you would also owe, owe penalty under this scenario all the way up until you're 59 and a half years old. So what you see now is from a liquidation value, pretty much the worst place to be is in a traditional IRA. The Roth IRA looks better, right? It's still not as good as the taxable. The Roth IRA looks better in the early years because uh, you, you're not paying taxes on your basis. You're just getting your basis back. So that first year you put 36,000 bucks in, your liquidation value, you have a $38,000 account value, but you can pull 36,000 out. It's just taking your money back out. So all you would pay would be taxes and penalties on that little bit of gain you have, which is why the liquidation value is so much better in the Roth IRA or the Roth 401k than it would be in a traditional IRA or a traditional 401k. Interesting thing here to note, uh, the liquidation value and the cash value life insurance policy still stinks. It's still the bottom of the barrel. But look out there in year 12 and 13. In this example, again, this is a 45-year-old right here. You see at the end of year one, we're 46. In this example, for a very short time frame, it looks the best. But what changes that? Well, what changes that is, oh, by the way, uh, well, I should probably finish that thought. What changes that is the uh, Roth IRA suddenly is beyond age 59 and a half and you owe nothing on it. So it starts looking better. But my point again here, there is a significant, look at the huge disparity, even in year nine, when both are still subject to some penalties because you're not 59 and a half years old, there is a, they both have a traditional IRA and a traditional, and a Roth IRA, 
both have a $461,000 account value, but the liquidation value is only two fifty-three dollars in the traditional IRA or the traditional 401k plan, as opposed to $399,000 in a Roth, whether it's a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k plan. The Roth just smokes it. If you have the option to have a Roth, there is no reason not to have a Roth. And you can play with the math. Yes, I know you have to pay taxes on the money up front. If you play with the math, it's better to put less in the Roth and have the same net take-home income than it is in the traditional. It's just math, guys. We already covered this. Sorry, I'm a little out of sync with my presentation. But again, there is just a couple of years there that the best place to be is inside the life insurance policy. But remember what happens at age 59 and a half? With the Roth is, all of a sudden you owe no penalties or taxes, period. So your account value and your spendable value, your liquidation value become one and the same. And you can see it now outpaces by a bunch. So if you can read across there, I know that's a little bit difficult, but it starts outpacing the taxable uh, account very, very significantly. So what you see there is taxes make all the difference in the world. Back to our original premise, should we be thinking now about where our taxes are, how much we're going to be taxed in the different types of vehicles we're using to save for any long-term and or retirement, any long-term needs or retirement? Absolutely we should because the numbers are just hugely different. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of dollars of difference in how much you're going to have in spendable income and in how much your Social Security income is going to be taxable and at what rate in your retirement years. So I stuck this slide in here just to remind myself that, again, back to the IRS limitations. If you're watching this video, if you're still engaged on this video, it almost certainly means you're either a high income earner or you anticipate being a high income earner at some point in the near future. And if that's the case, um, your income probably is not going to allow you to do a Roth 401k, or excuse me, a Roth IRA. And if you're a small business owner or a high income earner, there's a fair chance you're not going to be able to save a whole lot of money inside of a K plan, whether it's a traditional or a Roth K plan either. But even then, if you could do both, all you could save in there at most, if you're over the age of 50, would be $33,000 a year. And truthfully, this presentation is geared towards high income earners who are trying to save more than fifty, sixty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 a year. So. Uh, and e even if you're not there yet, bear with me because I think the lessons learned here uh, might be worth the additional five or eight minutes that are left in this video presentation so that you kind of have this in the back of your head when you are at the point where you can save those kind of dollars. So we have very, very sophisticated software from, uh, to do a lot of different things. But interestingly, one of the most sophisticated softwares is the life insurance software. And what I can do with the life insurance software is I can say, based upon all these different scenarios, I want to have some amount of income from age 65 to age 90. So by the way, this was a male uh, that we assume this 45-year-old was a male. 45-year-old male's life expectancy is about age 85. So I wanted to have income beyond his life expectancy with really no chance of not having an income. We had already established a 5.67% rate of return. Life insurance has the advantage of what's properly structured life insurance, has the advantage of what's called FIFO accounting treatment, first in, first out. So you can withdraw all your basis. You put $36,000 a year into it. You can withdraw all of those premium payments out with no taxes, withdrawal basis. And then again, properly structured life insurance offers something called an interest-free loan, usually after the 10th year. It's also known as a wash loan. And oh, by the way, there's death benefit in there. But what we did was we said, tell us, based upon that set of criteria, how much money I could pull out for those 26 years, age 65 to age 90. And the system said $156,335. We then said, okay, well, let's back test the other three options to see how much money we could pull out of them. So the first one we did was in the uh, taxable account. So remember early on it was the best performing but now you'll note we're starting at year 19 which is year age 64 and then at year 20 age 65 we start stripping money out of it. And we strip it out at 156 325 per year spendable so we're having to pull more money out of it than that so we pay taxes on that money. And what we discover is 
we can pull that out for nine years, and then in the tenth year, we can pull $144,445 out of the account, and the account is depleted. You see down there at the bottom of that row, that's $151,000 we were able to strip out of that account. Uh, then we looked at, and I just lumped them together, we looked at the traditional IRA or tradition, or this would also be, again, be the 401k and the Roth IRA and for, or 401k plan. And what you see here is, uh, in the traditional 401k, you could pull out eight years of income. Again, the problem with this one is all hit is ordinary income taxes, so it performs worse than a, not, than, than a taxable account even would. You can pull out 156 for eight years and then 47,000 in nine years. You only get a million, a little bit less than a million three out of the, and let's just, where we're talking about here really is inside a traditional 401k plan. The Roth, I've already told you this, it blows it out of the water. Almost double the money at $2.498 million you can strip out of a Roth. It's just the best option available to you here. But the life insurance, blows them all out. So properly structured and managed life insurance policy earning only 5.67% rate of return would generate over $4 million in tax-free retirement income under current tax law using interest-free loans, uh, withdrawal to basis, and then something called a participating loan that we can talk more about. We can be less aggressive and it still blows the other options away, but it is a instrument unlike any other financial instrument for some people. Again, it is not for everybody. I'm gonna show, some of you guys are gonna reach out, girls too, sorry. Some of you folks will reach out and the numbers are gonna look great on the life insurance. And some of them are gonna look terrible. If they look terrible, we won't do it. It's math, that's all this is. We're looking at the math on these options to see which is the best option for you. And it is different for everybody based upon your age, based upon your health, based upon how much money you want to save. All of it has a very significant impact. Looking at those four options together, you see here, they all had $3,000 a month flowing into them for 20 years at $720,000. Taxable account generates spendable $1.55 million. The traditional IRA 401k plan generates less uh, $1.298 million. The Roth IRA generates the best uh, of those three at $2.5 million. The cash value life insurance policy uh, as a long-term investment option is a great option, uh, $4 million. And again, that's only on $700,000 deposited into it. A couple of other notes on the life insurance policy. I've just turned into a life insurance sales guy here. Uh, there is no income limitation on how much you can put into it, but I'm not going to let you put 70% of your savings into it. This is for a portion of your savings. Uh, you've got to have the flexibility in funding. Avoid whole life insurance. Uh, there are limits the IRS has placed on it that it has to maintain the tax characteristics of a life insurance policy. Back to my statement earlier, you can't put a million dollars premium and a million dollar debt. You can have access to the account value at any time. It becomes much more attractive with most policies after age, or excuse me, after 10 years. So this will not work for a 70 year old. It's just, it's just not the right option, or maybe even for a 60 year old. You do get tax deferred growth, and then if you structure it properly, there's tax free distribution from it as well. By the way, one other thing here, for some folks in certainly Texas, and I think there's seven or eight other states, the account values are shielded from creditors, so you can't get sued and have this money attached. They can't reach this money uh, unless one of two things, the IRS can, the IRS can get to anybody's money. Uh, or if you did this to defraud a creditor. So if you were already in hot water with somebody, if you already had an issue, and then you set this up, the court would most likely say, yeah, you did this to defraud the creditor and they're gonna attach this money. But otherwise, for Texas residents in six other states, so if you, uh, if you own a trucking company, uh, if you own a construction company, any uh, industry with high liability where you get sued, might get sued, or have been sued, uh, this is a great instrument for you because you can shield this money from creditors like you can your homestead. It's a really, really cool instrument from that standpoint.
And an additional advantage to the life insurance is specific types of contracts, and they're called index contracts. They're built on a universal life insurance chassis, which you remember our conversation earlier between the difference between a universal life and a whole life policy. These policies participate in the market returns. They have a cap, but they participate through index investing, but they also have a floor. So you can get nice upside return and good strong bull markets, but in bear markets, your floor is zero or 1%. There's different contracts available. So that when the market turns down and it's down 30%, you don't give any of your returns or any of your money back by having losses inside the contract. By the way, why don't most financial planners talk about life insurance? Uh, number one, many of them don't understand the product. Uh, many of them don't pay attention to taxes. I heard a buzz term the other day. A traditional tax deferred financial planner is the term I heard. And that's the truth. Most of them are more concerned on, um, on uh, the account value than on the spendable value. Uh, they are compensated on assets under management. I'll show you what I mean by that right here in just a second. Uh, and then um, some of them, if, you, if you're not saving, if you're saving 25000 bucks a year, you're not getting far enough down the list for this to be a good option for you. And I've kind of built for this particular client what their options would have been. But let's review back to bullet point four. Uh, let's review what a typical financial planner would have made in that taxable account over those periods of years. So they would have made not much money in year one, not much money in year two, but remember they're making generally, and by the way, on this small of account balance, they would probably be making more like one and a half percent or 2%. We just assumed 1% here. Uh, they would make over the life of that contract, $176,000. This is their annuity, right? This is, they, they wanna hold that money as long as they can. I've also heard, and I, I don't know if I believe this or not, I've heard some folks online touting this is why some planners don't talk about um, Roth IRA conversions because if, they, if they're managing a million bucks and you do a Roth IRA conversion and you pay 300,000 in taxes, they just, they're now only managing 700 grand and they took a pay cut. I will tell you, every planner that I know that's worth their salt or talking to their clients about Roth IRA conversions because it's the right thing to do. But um, most of them aren't licensed to sell life insurance. They don't understand the products and they want that long-term stream of income. Trust me on this life insurance sale that was demonstrated here, there's not $176,000 of commission. There's a fraction of that. So uh, it's just their lack of understanding. Uh, by the way, I had built that out there. So lots of fees built in there. I just want to make one point before I move off of this. There are great wealth managers in the market. If you're working with a J.P. Morgan wealth manager, banker, if you're working with a, somebody at Bernstein, somebody at Goldman Sachs, somebody at Morgan Stanley, somebody at True North, they're great. They know what they're doing. They're going to be, they have what I call a back room, right? They have research behind them. They have a process. Where I have seen uh, troubling financial planning, if you will, is more the strip center people, the kind of standalone little community bank, uh, and I saw one a few years ago that sold an annuity wrapped inside of, of a retirement plan, which is just the only reason you do that. The only reason you do that is for higher commission. So there are great wealth managers in the marketplace. I know and work with a lot of them. I'm not picking on them as a whole. I'm picking on the ones who are sort of out there flying kind of by the seat of their pants and, and don't really have the back room and the know-how to be doing what they're telling people to be doing. So. So let's look at the order of how we had a particular client. And this is a fictional client, but it's really kind of not. This was a couple, 45 years old, both of them, a uh, couple of kids, and they wanted to save a substantial amount of money. And we knew we were going to blow through sort of some of the limits on their, uh, they actually did have a Roth option available to them in a 401k plan. But, um, and, and by the way, this changes for everybody, right? Uh, this particular couple also had kids they were trying to get ready to go to college. They had a 529 plan, largely funded, but they felt like they needed some additional money. So we piled a little bit of money uh, sort of in the taxable account to give them that. Uh, and then we also, we, we see clients who want to buy a ranch. They want to buy an airplane. They want to buy a lake house. They want to buy a lake. Uh, so there's lots of other reasons you would save in a different order than this. But so for this particular, uh, fictional client loosely based, we would want them first to start with six months of, of living expenses uh, because things happen, right? Look what just happened with COVID. A whole bunch of us are either out of work or working way less than we were. Our incomes are probably down. I saw today uh, AMC theaters 
uh, all their executive team are on furlough. Trust me, the C including the CEO, they're not getting paid. They, if you'd ask them in January, are you going to be without a paycheck in July? They'd have laughed at you. But look where they are now. They, they're, uh, they probably need to dip into some savings to support their family. So you need six months of savings in that tax deferred bucket. Next place, maximum fund your Roth if you have it available, 401k to the limits, if at all possible. $19,500 for you and your spouse, or 26 if you're over 50. By the way, traditional 401k plan does not fall on this grid because, as you saw a second ago, it's not the best option. But there's a caveat if you have a match, 6% dollar to dollar. 3%, uh, 50 cents on a dollar is 6%. Put it at the top of the list because that's free money. So it would fall number two if you don't have the Roth option. You'll want to get all the free money you can from your employer. So defer up to that amount. If it's a match to 6% and match to 8% and match to 10%, do that amount in the traditional if you don't have the Roth option to get that free match money from your employer. Next place, if your income allows it, uh, fund the Roth IRA, uh, Roth IRA for each of you, six or seven thousand dollars again, based upon your age. Uh, however, as we've already talked about, it's very likely that you can't do that based upon your income if you're this far into this video because you're interested in saving a lot of money, which means you have significant, um, probably net worth and or income. And then cash value life insurance. Uh, if the math works, and it doesn't work for everybody. Um, and I will tell you, uh, I, as funny as this sounds, we've had people, we've said, no, you do not save that much money, whatever that number was, 70000 100000 a lot more than that. Uh, we deal with very high net worth individuals who buy lots of life insurance and understand the tax deferred aspects of it. And what we want them to do is to do a number that they are very comfortable that no matter what happens, they can fund it for at least five to seven years from whatever source they want. But I don't want them in year two saying, yeah, I was going to do $80,000 a year, but I can really only do 40. It doesn't work as well when you short fund for a year. I'm fine with the flexibility of something awful happening and you needing to not do that. But I don't want you doing, we don't want you doing stretch amounts into the life insurance. It's going to be a small fraction of how much you save. And then anything above that, back either into muni bonds, eh, not the best return, or back into the taxable account, above the six months of savings. All of these numbers, by the way, assume that taxes don't increase. I think we established in part one of this, they almost certainly will. So you get a higher federal income tax rate, you get a, if you're in a state with a state income tax rate, and or they change how they tax cap gains, capital gains, from 20% to some 20 to 23.8% to some much higher number like ordinary income taxes, then you really got to start looking hard at that tax-free bucket. It, it's going to make more and more sense. So my offer to you is we'll do the math for you. Um, just uh, we can do this either over the phone, sit down in person, which is my preference, but right now that's hard to do, or through a Zoom call. Talk about what your goals are, what you're trying to save. And we'll do the math for you and we'll tell you, show you by the numbers what your best options are and do the same thing we did for this particular sample client, if you will. Uh, here's kind of where we think you should be saving and the order you should be saving in those and the dollar amounts you should be trying to save in there. So you see uh, my email address there, Ken Smith Advisor, not plural, uh, Ken Smith Advisor at iCloud.com or my direct dial number 972-816-5367. I would love the opportunity to have this discussion with you one-on-one uh, -on -one or with you and your spouse. And I've got a lot of other videos up and other videos on the way talking about a lot of other things uh, in the financial services industry. Uh, so please tune in, check out my other videos, and reach out if you'd like to talk. So thanks for tuning in. I know that was a long video, but I appreciate you staying all the way to the end, and I hope you found that helpful. Thanks, folks.